Welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources um, at the University of Kentucky. And once again, a cram-packed show. Yeah, Renee, I'm really excited about today's show. We're talking about an important species that's really being threatened. Um, we've got a guest coming in from the Kentucky Division of Forestry teaming up with um, Dr. Ellen Crocker. We're also featuring a couple of our county extension agents on segments today, too. So I'm always excited about that. You know, just a reminder, you know, the Cooperative Extension Service here in Kentucky, we have an office in every county and you have local resources available to work with you, whether it's in family and consumer sciences, 4-H and youth development, or agricultural and natural resources. So if you don't know those folks, please get to know them. Um, they're a great local resource. And whether you're joining us via Zoom um, or on Facebook Live, we're glad to have you with us. You can um, input questions in the chat pod via Zoom or leave comments on Facebook Live and we'll get to those as soon as we can. Exactly. So since we are so cram packed, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about hemlock. We yeah. have uh, Dr. Ellen Crocker and um, Alexandria Blevins on with us to talk about that. And yeah. Ellen, you want to kind of introduce our segment just a little bit? Great. Um, so we, we talked briefly last time, but um, hemlock trees uh, are you know, great native trees for our state. They do a lot for us. Um, they tend to grow in these uh, areas right along rivers and these sensitive habitats. And a lot of our um, kind of amphibians will depend on them in those areas. Uh, they're really important for water quality and they're just really cool trees. Uh, but there is an invasive insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid, that has been really wiping them out. Um, so this insect uh, is from Asia, native to Asia, and uh, what it does is it sucks on uh, the sap of the tree. It, you can see it kind of under the, the underside of the needles, these fuzzy white things um, at certain times of year, uh, but they suck the sap out of them and over time it can really stress the tree and kill it. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about hemlock um, and also, uh, you know, what, what we're doing about it. So there are some things that woodland owners can do to protect individual trees. Um, so there are insecticides that can be used to protect a tree uh, from the hemlock woolly adelgid. But there's also some really exciting work going on to try to long-term control the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid using predatory insects. So these are insects um, that will actually eat those adelgids. And so our hope is is that long term, that's going to be part of how we protect our hemlocks and keep them on the landscape long term. And so uh, uh, the Kentucky Division of Forestry has been leading a lot of that work here in Kentucky. And we have with us today Alexandra Blevins, who's the forest health specialist with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And we're going to show you a short video um, of a day when I tagged along with them uh, to the Daniel Boone National Forest uh, for one of their projects. Uh, releasing some of these predatory beetles, but also talking a little bit about the work that they've been doing treating trees with insecticides. After that, we'll have Jeremy Williams on. He's a county agent, and he's going to give you some tips for if you've got hemlock in your woods, um, what you can do to protect them. All right. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, Ellen, thanks all for the segment. And Renee, I'll go ahead and get her rolling. Hello again, everyone. This is Alexandra Blevins with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And we are out here today at Dog Slaughter Falls to talk about our hemlock treatment program. So you might have heard that the hemlock woolly adelgid has been here in Kentucky, most likely from around 2006. And the Kentucky Division of Forestry has actually been treating for this invasive insect that is harming our beautiful hemlock trees since 2009. At first, we were just treating at some of our state forests, and then we started to branch out into our state parks and uh, national forest land. So we are here in a part of the Daniel Boone National Forest, and we are checking out these hemlock trees. And so, you know, you might have hemlocks on your property and you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I really like these trees and I want to do my part to try and save them. So today we're using a biological control method with a predatory beetle that specializes on feeding on the hemlock woolly adelgid, but there is another option as well. 
you can also use a chemical treatment um, applying an insecticide, a metacloprid is what it's called, that you can find at your local hardware store and you can treat your trees chemically by yourself. If you would like to find out more information about both of these treatment options, you can reach out to your local extension office or you can contact the Kentucky Division of Forestry or the UK Forest Health Extension. And I'm out here today at the beautiful Dog Slaughter Falls Trailhead just outside of Cumberland State uh, Cumberland Falls State Park. And what I have with me here in this jug are Laracobius nigrinus beetles. And these are predatory beetles that feed specifically on the hemlock woolly adelgid. The hemlock woolly adelgid is an invasive bug that is attacking our beautiful hemlock trees that you can see here in the background. Right now, they are starting to become active, and so that's why we're out here today releasing these predatory beetles, because these beetles are a biological control agent that um, is helping to, you know, keep at bay the uh, levels of hemlock woolly adelgid that we have here in our state. So there are another way that we can help to treat these trees um, besides a uh, insecticide treatment. So um, we are releasing these guys um, onto these trees here along the roadside. Um, we're looking for trees that get ample sunlight. They've never been chemically treated before. Um, and the reason that is a, you know, a very important reason for that, um, if these trees were to be treated with insecticide and these little guys were to eat the adelgid that have been treated, then they would also die as well. So that's a very important piece to the puzzle. So these trees have never been treated before, but as you can see, they still look fairly healthy. And that's because they've got ample sunlight with this uh, break in the road here. And, um, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So they will have the, you know, you want to have a high adelgid, hemlock woolly adelgid population because that's what they feed on. So we have been checking these trees, um, you know, in the past couple weeks to make sure that there is a healthy enough population to support these beetles. And so we have 500 of these guys with us today, and we're going to select five trees and distribute them as evenly as we can, and then we'll come back and you know keep your fingers crossed that we will uh, find larva after these guys mate and are happy. And then next year, we will hopefully come back and find more adults. And so our objective with this release program is um, to hopefully build a filled insectary for future use so we can you know come back here and uh, are able to easily just get these beetles off these trees and distribute them to other areas the beetles are very tiny they're kind of hard to see probably right now but believe me they're in here and uh, what we're doing is just lightly draping these hemlock branches on this tree Thank you all very much for that video. That was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that, uh, so you just basically take, I guess, branches that you've already had and put them on the tree. And so then they, your ho the hope is that the beetles will just go onto the tree. Is that, is that what you're hoping for? That is correct. Okay. <laughs> so um, we do have a question. Someone wants to know how far do the beetles range? Well, okay. you know, they are a very, <laughs> yes, they are a flying insect. They are very tiny though. Um, their specific range, I am not quite sure of. I'll have to do some research on that. Ellen, would you happen to know? I don't know, but I do think that, um, you know, there are, um, one of the challenges with these predatory beetles is that um, you know, we want them to eat the hemlock woolly adelgids. We want them to keep their populations in control, but they also have to be able to survive long term and um, not just one year, you know, apply them every year. That's a lot of work. You want them to persist in the environment. Um, and that's been one of the challenges with these beetles in the past is uh, getting them to, to thrive in this, this area that's new to them. 
Um, and so I'm excited about the work that you all are doing to try to establish some populations here that then could be used because right now people can't just go out and buy these predatory beetles, right? Um, they're hard to come by. <laughs> But hopefully the work that you're doing will build a, a local uh, nursery for them, which is pretty cool. That is the hope. So we do have a question too, is would the beetles become an invasive issue? We have been uh, asked that question many times before, and I do understand people's concerns about that. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel, I think, for that question is, though, that these predatory beetles are very specialized on hemlock woolly adelgid. So um, with the research that's gone into this before they were authorized to be released in the wild all across the eastern United States, um, you know, they found that, you know, they're very specialized to HWA and we hope that they aren't going to affect any other beneficial insect populations. And there's actually, uh, you know, I think um, uh, there's a couple different predatory beetles that people use, right, for this. Um, there are some that are native to North America, but not this part of North America and others that are native to Asia, right? That is correct. And uh, the work that the Kentucky Division of Forestry is doing, uh, we release two separate species. Um, they are both from the Laracobius genus, which is the, for the common name, it's the tooth-necked fungus beetles. And so there is a species that comes from the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we will have individuals that go collect the beetles that are native to the US and they have evolved with uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid along the Western coast of our uh, country. And then the other species, uh, Laracobius osakensis, uh, this is from Japan. So this is found in the same area where the invasive hemlock woolly adelgid hails from. Okay, interesting. Uh, uh, quick question. Do you all have a sense for how um, on the West Coast the hemlocks are faring over there? Or is it because the beetle population's there that they're, it's in check? Is hemlock woolly adelgid in check, if you will, on the West Coast compared to maybe here on the Eastern United States? That's an excellent question. And, um, you know, due to the fact that there is this native predatory beetle already in existence out there that evolved with HWA in that region of the country, um, it has been kept in check. So the hemlocks are faring a lot better than they are here in the eastern region of the uh, country. And I just want to mention something. In addition to the great work that Kentucky Division of Forestry is doing with these predatory beetles, you have a really active hemlock treatment program as well that you mentioned in a video. Um, but you treat and you have a, a, a hemlock team that treats a lot of trees each year, right? Yes, um, we have a treatment program that was started back in 2009. So HWA was found here, we believe in 2006 was the first discovery. And then KDF um, put together a program to treat our hemlocks in these vital areas. And so um, we have treated over 192,000 trees to date. And so the primary uh, areas where we do these treatments are within as I mentioned in the video, our state parks and our state forests and also in uh, federal lands, uh, the Daniel Boone National Forest. And so uh, within these areas, we have uh, what are called hemlock treatment, uh, hemlock conservation areas or HCAs. And so every year, um, starting in September and working through May, we have a crew that is out there um, scaling these mountainsides uh, treating these trees with the chemical insecticide imidacloprid. And so the uh, technique that we use is a soil drench technique. So uh, our crew, they're out there hiking the hills. Um, they will mix the chemical uh, from a natural water source. And uh, so it's dry chemical that's packed in and you will do uh, the mixture while you're out in the field, uh, which makes it a lot easier to transport. And then uh, you, we use an optimal dosage per, uh, per the diameter of the tree. And so you'll get a measurement on the tree and then based on that measurement, you will divvy out the appropriate amount of chemical. And so we uh, 
remove the duff layer so you can see the uh, root hairs of the hemlock that you're treating, get down to the mineral soil, and then you will pour that amount of chemical as evenly distributed around the base of the hemlock tree. And then uh, it's a systemic chemical, so it will uh, travel through the root system of that tree up through the trunk into the infected area of the tree around uh, the base of those needles where the adelgids are found. Does it have to be done more than once? Uh, that's another excellent question. So, you know, we, it's called an integrated pest management approach. So we have the one tactic, which is the chemical treatments. And so unfortunately, this doesn't last forever. It only lasts for approximately five to seven years. So retreatments are necessary. And then the other tactic that we use, uh, which was demonstrated in the video with these biological control agents or these predatory beetles, uh, we're hoping to you know, integrate those two systems together to protect as many hemlocks as we can. So are you doing the, the treatments of the chemical and then the beetles in different areas so that the chemicals don't kill the beetles? <laughs> that is a very integral part to the puzzle. So yes, we <laughs> We don't want to uh, treat a tree and then release beetles on that same tree because that would uh, end a very bad fate for the predatory beetles. Yeah. So I want to um, invite Jeremy Williams to join this discussion as well. Um, he's the uh, Ag and Natural Resources agent in Harlan County and has a lot of experience working with landowners um, dealing with all sorts of issues, but um, Hemlock Willie Adelja being among them. And, uh, we know, we, we, Alexander was talking a little bit about what the um, Kentucky Division of Forestry team does, but when you encounter woodland owners who've got hemlock and are maybe concerned, uh, what do you recommend that they do or think about? Uh, there is a, uh, uh, you know, pretty much a protocol that you, you need to look at is, you know, how many do you want to treat? Uh, there's an expense to it, uh, definitely. And, uh, uh, with the chemical treatment, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, I will recommend right off the top, follow the directions on the, on the package. Uh, the directions are the law uh, and follow them to a T. Also, uh, the more you use, the more expensive it gets. So if it says, whatever it says on that package, go with that. Uh, the the soil drench, like Alexandria mentioned, works great. Uh, she mentioned five to seven years. That that seems to be what I what I've seen on some of these trees. And uh, one of the things that I do tell landowners is, you're not going to be able to save a whole forest unless you have the expense. You know, unless you unless you have the money for the expense of it, you're not going to be able to save a whole forest. But you're going to be able to save trees, and that definitely uh, makes those landowners feel a whole lot better when they have uh, a really nice old hemlock out behind their house or three or four or around some outbuildings or something like that, that they, that they can treat that every three to five years, five to seven years, however it may be. Uh, and, and it's easy, it's easy to see because you're going to see those white cottony masses on the limbs and it's, it's easy to pick out. So, uh, uh, that's one of the things that I typically tell people is follow the directions on the, on the package and, uh, and it, and it works. So one of the things is that we saw when we uh, first treated the, the first trees that were found, uh, first HWA that was found here in, the, in Kentucky was found here in Harlan County. And that was, I think, in April of 2006. And so we uh, treated those trees uh, as on a private landowner, treated those trees. And uh, by June or July, uh, maybe even August, uh, they had some new growth on those trees. And so uh, it's really good to see that. Uh, now we did see a, a couple of, uh, of uh, winters that uh, there were some spells that it got down to uh, around zero for about five days. And that helped us as well. That helped to, to help fight that some HWA. But uh, uh, the treatment, uh, the chemical treatment uh, is fairly easy. It's simple. It's, uh, it's uh, straightforward. So. So you have seen, Jeremy, that once a tree is affected, that the treatment will still help it then? Yes, the treatment. And, and that's one of the things that you see is uh, you're going to see that and you want to treat those trees uh, that you do see the, the HWA on. So it does, it takes care of it. Along those lines, Jeremy or Alexander or Ellen, um, you know, I know with like 
um, the ash, we're having issues with that, you know, and at a certain threshold, it's really probably not good to treat the tree because it's not going to make a big difference. Um, do you have kind of a similar kind of guideline when we're looking at hemlocks, you know, how much infestation or how much damage is too much um, to where the tree would not respond to the treatment? Well, I think one of the big problems with ash is that um, the way the, the, the emerald ash borer impacts trees is it's tunneling in the vascular system of the tree. And that's exactly what those trees need to move the systemic insecticide you know, throughout the tree. Uh, fortunately for us, the way that the hemlock woolly adelgid works and damages the tree is a little bit different. So not only does it take a lot longer to kill a tree than the emerald ash borer, um, it's impacting those shoots and those needles um, more than it is that vascular system of the tree. Um, so certainly if the tree is too far gone, um, save your money and treat some trees that aren't uh, because this tends to be a little bit patchy on the landscape. So you would probably still be able to find some trees that, that are really good candidates. Um, but uh, you've got a little bit longer than you do with something like emerald ash borer where you really do need to catch it early on. Um, um, well, that's good. It's a little more yeah. flexible as far as when you can treat it then, for sure. Definitely. All right. All right. Well, that seems to be all the questions we have for you uh -huh. today. I appreciate all of you uh, joining us today. Yeah. Yeah, Alexandra, thank you and appreciate the Kentucky Division of Forestry and all the great work you all do. Um, I'll remind folks that not only do they do forest health stuff, um, but they also do a lot of other things as well, whether it's um, if you're a woodland owner, they can come out and help you with that. Or if you're looking for tree seedlings, they can help you there. And they also fight our wildfires. So a big thank you um, to all the Kentucky Division of Forestry folks for all the great work you all do. Thanks, and Alexandra. Thanks for highlighting our work. Appreciate yeah, and, it. And thanks, Jeremy, for joining. I mean, I think it's just uh, such a such a fantastic example of all of the um, knowledge and uh, expertise from uh, county offices. So if those of you listening haven't yet contacted your county extension office, don't know your agents, you really should uh, because um, they can, you know, they help you in so many different ways. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Renee, we kind of switch gears a little bit, get away from the hemlock woolly adelgid and some of the kind of the destruction that it's facing right now. And we're going to be talking about the, our weekly segment, the tree of the week. Hey, Laurie. And we have hey. Laurie Thomas on. We greatly appreciate her doing these every week. Well, uh, like I say, I really enjoy doing these. So it's a lot of fun. This week I um, picked out a tree that um, it's called staghorn sumac. Some of you are familiar with it. Some of you may not be. It's not found all across the state, but um, it is an important uh, winter wildlife tree because it does retain some of its fruit into the winter when a lot of our birds and stuff are out there looking for extra food. So here's the staghorn sumac. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the staghorn sumac. Staghorn sumac, Res tafina, which is the currently accepted scientific name. The alternate is Res hirta. Another common name is Velvet sumac. It is a member of the Anacardiaceae, or the sumac or cashew family. Other members of this family include cashew, mango, pistachio, poison ivy, and poison oak. There are 14 species of sumac native to United States. This small tree or tall shrub typically grows up to maybe 30 to 40 feet tall with a diameter less than 10 inches. The tree usually has a short, poorly formed trunk with a wide spreading open crown. Staghorn sumac can become weedy or invasive on some sites, but it is shade intolerant and will not persist in a forest that has a closed canopy. It is an important winter wildlife tree and used in landscape planting. Staghorn sumac is native to the northeastern United States into Michigan and Minnesota and the Appalachian Mountains. It is found in north central and central Kentucky with some occurrences in a few counties in western Kentucky. Staghorn sumac is primarily a tree of the forest edge and disturbed sites as well as old fields. It grows on dry, rocky, or gravelly soils. In Kentucky, staghorn sumac can be confused with smooth sumac and the tree of heaven. Staghorn sumac is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are pinnately compound, which is a leaf that's made up of numerous leaflets that are arranged on each side of the leaf's central stalk or rachis. The leaves are typically 16 to 24 inches long and have between 11 to 31 lance-shaped leaflets. 
The leaflets have serrated margins and are between 2 to 5 inches long and they're green above and pale below. The leaf stalk or rachis is very fuzzy. It's said to resemble deer antlers in velvet, which this is a really good identifying um, characteristic for this tree. Staghorn sumac has showy fall colors of vibrant red. Staghorn sumac is usually dioecious, meaning there are male trees and female trees. The flowers are small and have yellow-green petals. The flowers are grouped in upright cone-shaped clusters that are usually about 8 inches long. The tree flowers in midsummer, usually between June through July, and the flowers are pollinated by many species of short-tongued bees, wasps, and flies. Staghorn sumac also forms large, dense colonies via root sprouts, and studies have shown that this mode of reproduction results in the largest number of stems. The fruit of staghorn sumac is a red, fuzzy droop, which is a berry-like fruit. The droops are about 1 8 inch in diameter and are in upright cone-shaped terminal clusters. The droops mature in late summer around September and they'll persist into winter. The fruit is eaten by a variety of wildlife who are responsible for seed dispersal and seed germination is enhanced by passing through the animal's digestive system. Staghorn sumac is considered a consistent seed producer, producing some seed every year. Staghorn sumac bark is gray-brown and smooth, and it's also fuzzy when the tree is young. As the tree ages, the bark becomes somewhat scaly with visible lenticels, which are small openings that allow the passage of air. Staghorn sumac wood has a consistently yellow to olive green coloration, one of the few woods that do. The sapwood is grayish-white. It is ring porous or semi-ring porous, which is wood that has larger vessels in the early wood, the wood that's formed in the early part of the growing season, than in the late wood, the wood that's formed later in the growing season. The early wood and late wood vessels form one growth ring. Ring porous structure is mainly present in regions with distinct seasons. Sumac is rated as non-durable regarding decay resistance. It is not a commercially important wood due to the tree's small size, but is occasionally harvested by hobbyists for specialty wood products. Staghorn sumac is an important winter wildlife food for a variety of animals. The fruit is an important winter food for game birds, including ruffed grouse and ringneck pheasants, bobwhite quail, wild turkey, as well as 30, more than 30 different species of songbirds, including robins, bluebirds, and mourning doves. Fox squirrel and rabbits eat the bark, and white-tailed deer and moose browse on the leaves and stems. Staghorn sumac is planted as an ornamental, particularly for low water use plantings, although its habit of producing root sprouts is detrimental to lawn maintenance. The wood is used for small specialty items such as turned bowls and serving utensils. The fruit is used to make beverages such as sumac tea and lemonade, as well as herbal tonics and jelly. All parts of the sumac, except the roots, can be used as a natural dye. The national champion staghorn sumac is located in Revilla, Montana. It is 44 inches in circumference, 19 feet tall, with a 26-foot crown spread. There currently is no staghorn sumac listed for Kentucky as champion. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about staghorn sumac. The common name of staghorn sumac is due to the velvety texture and the forking pattern of the branches, which is reminiscent of deer antlers in velvet. The tree is rich in tannins and was used for leather tanning in Appalachia. The leaves and berries of staghorn sumac were mixed with tobacco and other herbs and smoked by Native Americans. The scientific genus name Russ is from the Greek Russ, which is the common name of the sumac. The species name Tafina means cat-tail-like, referring to the hairy branches. I'm glad you joined me to learn about this sumac, and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park, or neighborhood, and enjoy the splendid staghorn sumac. Lori, it's always a pleasure having those videos. We greatly appreciate it. And you know, one thing I was wondering, um, I like the, the idea that it's a shorter tree, but you made it sound like that's something you wouldn't want to plant in your backyard. 
Maybe not. It's something you'd have to maintain because it does root sprout and it will spread. You'll notice the, the photo there towards the end that was taken at the UK Arboretum. And that's a big patch, like clonal patch of those um, staghorn sumacs. And it spreads pretty rapidly. So it's, yeah, not, not meant necessarily for a small landscape, but it is nice in landscape plantings because it does offer some winter appeal with those fuzzy branches mm -hmm. and it's got great fall color. So if it's something you can maintain and keep in a certain area, it's a nice um a nice addition to a larger landscape so is it found across kentucky it isn't um when you look at uh, the usda plants database range maps and you can actually zoom in and it's going to take you down to your state county by county you'll see it's only found in about 20 counties and um, that doesn't mean it's not been planted other places um, but we've got it mostly along the Ohio River up in the northern and over to the northeast part of the state. Uh, there's some in Jefferson, a few counties here in central Kentucky, and we actually have Warren and um, another county out west, and there's uh, three counties out west that it occurs in. So it's not found across the state. So some of you all may not have seen it. You may have seen another a similar one, which is smooth sumac. It's um, a, a relative of the staghorn sumac, but it's smooth. It doesn't have the fuzzy and velvety branches on it. Okay. All right. I thought, I thought it was interesting that it's um, related to cashews and pistachios, two of my favorite nuts. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, no, I know. That was something I don't remember learning when I was in school. I knew it was related to poison ivy and poison oak. We learned that, you know, being in the Anacardiaceae family. But yeah, that that whole family includes a lot of yummy nuts too. So. All right, cool. All right. Well, Laurie, thanks again. We really enjoy <laughs> those every week. And yeah. It, it, uh, folks, I'll tell you, if you haven't seen them all, we've got them all on our YouTube channel, too. You can check out not only all the Tree of the Weeks, but all of our individual segments um, are mostly up there as well. So another mm -hmm. nice one, Renee. So yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right, so moving on to some yummy treats. I know it's a sweet treat and it does have a really important kind of tie to the wood industry here in Kentucky. And, um, you know, we, we're, we're fortunate to have one of our county extension agents with us today, Mindy. Hi, Mindy. How are you? I'm good. How are you all? Oh, good. good. Glad to have you with us. So you're going to be talking about a kind of iconic um, treat that we have here in Kentucky around the holidays. That's right. You can't beat bourbon balls, in <laughs> but you can eat them anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> or anytime, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention about before we played your segment, if possible, Mindy, is, um, you know, one of the things we're working on in our department here is the White Oak Initiative. You know, we're having a lot of problems getting White Oak reestablished um, across the landscape and for a variety of reasons. And fortunately, we've got one of our team members who is coordinating the effort here in Kentucky, uh, Mr. Darren Morris. Um, Darren, I was hoping you would maybe, maybe say a few words about kind of the linkage uh, between the White Oak um, Initiative and White Oaks and what Mindy's going to be talking about. Right. Well, you know, we didn't just figure this out. Oaks have been used for barrels for hundreds of years, uh, you know, back to Roman times, actually. Uh, and American white oak, which is what some call it, is the one that we have. And uh, it's, you know, it provides everything that we need to make bourbon uh, the way that we know it. And um, one thing in particular is, you know, when you make a barrel and you put bourbon in it, it can't leak out on the floor. Um, which is what would happen if you did uh, build those barrels with red oak. So white oak has clogged pores uh, with something called tyloses, and that's perfect. You know, white oak and then others in the white oak group has, have these tyloses, which make them ideal uh, for the bourbon industry. But there's more. Um, you know, the, the hemicellulose in, in white oak, whenever it's charred and toasted, uh, caramelizes. It creates the vanillins that provide the bourbon the flavor um, and that, you know, the charring process happens fast. Uh, you can over char. Uh, you, you want that area, that space between the charred wood and the, the uncharred wood, which is where those flavors, uh, um, the vanillins re reside. Um, but the toasting process can go longer, um, you know, w without without over toasting, so to speak. So there's a happy balance there uh, between the toasting and the charring that creates basically all of the color that we know in bourbon um, and most of the flavor. Uh, 
the combination of the two are almost endless. That's why there's so much study going on with, uh, you know, the, the white oak and, and what actually creates this uh, magical thing that happens when we combine the two together. Very interesting. I know, you know, it, what a, you know, I think we should claim bourbon as a wood product. I really do because, you know, you can't have bourbon without um, wood. So Darren, thanks for that information. Appreciate that very much. You know, Mindy, there's another kind of a tree product in bourbon balls as well. That's right. We use those pecans, both chopped and then um, a half pecan on the top of the, of the bourbon ball. So those pe pecan trees are really, really important as well. Yeah. Sounds right. like you can't have bourbon balls without forestry. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. I, I, I always tell you, trees are the answer, right? Doesn't matter the question, trees are the answer. So we'll figure out somehow. Yeah. All right, yeah. Mindy, thank you so much. We're going to show your video, um, and then hopefully we can um, have you back on, and we can talk a little bit about it afterwards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bourbon balls are an iconic Kentucky treat. We enjoy them at Derby, at Valentine's, at Christmas time, well, really any time of the year. I'm Mindy McCulley, Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Specialist for Instructional Support. There are probably as many bourbon ball recipes as there are brands of bourbon. But today I'm gonna to share my family's favorite bourbon ball recipe. You'll need one cup of chopped pecans, five tablespoons of bourbon, one pound of confectioner's sugar, one stick of butter, one teaspoon of lemon juice, dipping chocolate, and one pecan half for each candy piece. You can use your favorite bourbon at this step, but you're going to want to use a good quality bourbon. This recipe will produce four to five dozen bourbon balls, depending on the size of the ball. I prefer to make mine smaller as it makes dipping easier. As with the bourbon, you'll want to use high quality dipping chocolate to ensure that your final product is the best quality.
if you do not have a double boiler, you can always craft one by putting a bowl over top a pan of simmering water. Alternately, you can melt chocolate in the microwave, but you must be careful not to scorch the chocolate. So always use reduced power and only for short periods of time, 15 to 30 seconds maximum. There are lots of tools available to aid in dipping chocolate, but for me, the easiest method is just to stick a toothpick down into each ball and then dredge it through the chocolate um, and give it a little shake uh, to get the excess chocolate off. And that allows for the least amount of waste. that surely would be a nice uh, gift idea. I definitely <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, everybody wants a, I, I'm getting a text now. It says, can we get a recipe? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to watch the segment again. Now, Mindy, that was great. Thank you so much. Well, and definitely you can find that video. Actually, it's on our um, Family and Consumer Science YouTube channel. Um, so if you just go to, um, it's actually a bit.ly link, um, bit.ly forward slash FACS underscore learning underscore channel and learning and channel are both capitalized. So you can go watch that anytime. But as I mentioned, there are recipes, um, probably more recipes than, than um, we, we have available, you know, time to talk about. But we do have a couple of recipes in the plated up, uh, I'm sorry, in the Proud of Kentucky cookbook um, that was produced by a Family and Consumer Sciences Extension about 10 years ago. Um, and one of those recipes actually doesn't call for chocolate. So if chocolate is not something that um, you want to include, then you can use um, the recipe that uses vanilla wafers and um, confection sugar as the, as the um, coating on the outside. Um, so there are lots and lots of recipes. Um, also in that Pride of Kentucky cookbook uh, is the recipe that Family and Consumer Sciences um, extension created, I think 96 um, or 100 dozen candies were created for the 1987 um, National Extension Association for Family and Consumer Sciences when they came to Lexington. They came back um, in 2014, I think it was, we did not make bourbon balls that time. Uh, it, we learned that, that that's a, a, a really time consuming process and so maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, but it is, they're, they're great to have. Um, they're great to have around. My husband will snack on them, um, you know, in the evenings, but as with all um, foods we recommend in failing consumer science moderation. Um, so, you know, you don't want to uh, make a meal out of the bourbon balls, <laughs> as we say. I think you have a question about, is it salted butter or unsalted butter? Um, I use salted butter, but um, unsalted would work as well. It just would, um, you know, have a little bit of a different flavor. Um, I just, always have salted butter on hand. So that's what I use. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it, they're, they're fun to make. They do take a little bit of time. So mm -hmm. they are a bit of a time commitment. Maybe I was going to ask, um, when you're letting that stuff sit out, whether it's the pecans and the bourbon or the actual, the little balls, um, do you refrigerate those or is it just on the counter? Or? No, I just uh, leave those out. As I said, I cover the, um, the, of course I put a cover on the, the nuts as they're soaking in the bourbon. Um, and, that's on the counter. Um, and then once I've made the balls, they also can sit on the counter. Um, I, I cover them with wax paper just to, you know, 
keep anything from getting in it, but um, you know, just to give that loose covering so that they will dry because you don't do want that. And we forgot to mention the wood product, the toothpicks that I use. <laughs> yeah. Grab them. So that's you know more wood needed for this. There we go. <laughs> you give me a tip for making my peanut butter balls too for the toothpicks. I was like, yeah. hey, that's an idea. <laughs> it's, it, it's a whole lot less mess than the the spiral uh, dippers or or mm -hmm. uh, those other things. And so and that's also on. Um, on the recipe, I didn't tell you how much dipping chocolate to use um, because it depends on how messy you are and how much you, you waste. Um, I usually have two pounds and then I will use about a pound um, depending on how, how um, I guess impatient I am about letting that extra <laughs> chocolate dip all, drip you know, off. I was surprised to see, I thought there was more bourbon in bourbon balls. Yeah, so there isn't a whole lot of bourbon. Somebody asked uh, one time if you could get uh, tipsy on the bourbon balls, you would get sick from the sugar long before <laughs> you could ever get tipsy. Um, and you would have to eat probably three or four batches at least uh, to get tipsy. So I don't, I don't think that that's a concern. <laughs> oh, another great wood product, right? Oh. Definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Mandy, thank you so much. We'll have to have you back for some more kind of um, wood inspired um, cooking. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that, I mean, this was a stretch, but we made it work, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We greatly appreciate you being on. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. All right. Thank you, Mandy. Appreciate it. Oh, Renee, another great show. Yeah. You know, we had covered some really interesting and important topics and um, mm -hmm. we appreciate you all, all being with us on a weekly basis. Um, you know, as a reminder, all of our shows are posted on our fromthewoodstoday.com website. So mm -hmm. please check that out. Um, any episodes you might have missed. And, you know, as always, please help us spread the word about this. We think there's a lot of other people out there that would enjoy From the Woods Today. So please help us um, push it out. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, we're on every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And so um, just make sure that you tune in. But until then, take care. Yeah. Bye. See everybody next week. Bye bye.